I actually worked out the material in this book uh, over the course of a few years, and I ran some of it by this group on a few occasions. Uh, but some of the, many of the students have cycled through, so it's time to come back around and do it again. And I've got another like short type version of it. Uh, and a couple of you guys are doing video. That's great. Um, if you guys lo uh, load that up on the internet, could you let me know where it is so I can find it, link it up? And it. All right. So um, let's get to business. All right. So the cold hard facts. I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna stand here so I can kind of see too the reading. Uh, the grim fact: 78 percent of Americans are Christians. 77 percent believe that Jesus was executed and came back from the dead. Kind of raises an interesting question about that one percent difference there, so we'll leave them alone for the moment. Um, so the resurrection, as I see it, and the reason I'm, I'm so preoccupied with the resurrection and it occupies about forty percent of the book is it's, it's cornerstone of Christian doctrine, right? If you don't have the resurrection of Jesus, then that changes everything. I think the whole Christian religion collapses unless you can get some kind of justification for thinking that Jesus was resurrected. I, I'll assume you all have got the rough outlines. Of that story in mind, I'll explain some of it here as we move along. But allegedly, Jesus comes back from the dead. And that, metaphorically, morally, spiritually, physically, politically, whatever, provides for Christian salvation scheme, it provides for unification with God, atonement, or something. Jesus is coming back from the dead. All right, so why do they believe? Nothing particularly interesting about that sign other than very much why the believers in Baptist Church. They believe because, obviously, the Bible, right? We all do that. 30% of Americans say that the Bible is literally true. Uh, link them up with polling data that shows that roughly 4 in 10 Americans are young Earth creationists. Uh, so that means 4 in 10 Americans believe that uh, the Earth, the universe, all life on Earth, all human life, all non-human life on Earth was all created in its more or less present form within the last 10,000 years. Lots of political candidates believe this, or they say they believe it, um, and a huge number of Americans believe it. Uh, another 50% say perhaps they won't agree to it's being literally true, but they think it's the inspired word of God, so they take it quite seriously. And the resurrection story comes from the Bible primarily. We really don't have any other sources, any other reasons to think that the resurrection happened than the Bible saying so. Which brings me to this issue. Being in the Bible, of course, some statement being in the Bible all by itself is not enough because you got this problem. <laughs> okay, come on, that's funny. <laughs> right? I'm going to call this the Spider-Man problem. Uh, the fact that it's stated in the Bible is no more proof that it's true than the fact that Spider-Man is in the comic book makes that true. And I'm going to just ruin the joke that it wasn't funny. I'm going to ruin it even worse with a little philosophical analysis. Um, you've got to have, you've got to have, all those believers have got to have some kind of justification for believing in the Bible of the Bible. So let's call it the Spider-Man problem. Anyone who depends in part or in whole upon a religious document to justify a belief must have some independent grounds for thinking that what the document says is true. Unless you can do that, then, you know, what's the point of it? This, this is the problem, of course, when someone starts quoting the Bible of, as a kind of justification. Well, fine, the Bible says it, but the Spider-Man says this. Um, that the document says X is true by itself is not enough. In issue 227, it shows that Spider-Man put the Green Goblin in jail. Therefore, the Green Goblin is, in fact, in jail. <laughs> Okay, well, I need some other grounds to think that the green problem is real or that it's in jail than merely the fact that the issue says it. Okay, so that means then that what believers need, and they know this, many of them have made this sort of appeal, they need to make a historical case for Jesus. So let me give you a rundown on the, on the argument that they have typically made. Now, there's a hundred variations on theme here. I'm going to give you some highlights, and I'm going to give you a bunch of bullets, probably nine or ten here. But just give you a flavor, a sense of the flavor of what kind of justifications to be given. Many of you have already heard of this kind of justification. Um, they will say, well, we've got multiple eyewitness accounts of the resurrection. Uh, the resurrection would have been too difficult to fake since Jesus' execution was so public. It was such a big event. Uh, it's often claimed that mass hallucinations are impossible. You couldn't have all of these people seeing the same thing and reporting the same story. The witnesses would not have had any ulterior motive. 
since reporting them could get them persecuted, possibly killed. And there's a common widespread view amongst Christian apologists who will say that uh, that the followers of Jesus, either shortly after or, or within the years that followed his execution, uh, were all hunted down, persecuted, and then killed. Uh, that's been investigated by more reliable historians, and I think it's been fairly fun. I don't think we have any evidence of them that the followers were actually persecuted and killed for their beliefs. But it nevertheless gets repeated a lot in you know, Sunday morning church uh, across the country. Okay, the followers were so convinced that they gave up their jobs and their possessions, uh, are, if we are to take those stories, stories seriously. The New Testament events um, have other New, New Testament events that have been historically corroborated, the reign of Herod, the destruction of the temple, the growth of the early church, and so on. So these are all reasons to think that what the Bible tells us is reliable. The Jews could not have come up with the resurrection idea on their own, say some of the scholars. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, if, if that bothers you, it should. That ought to sort of give you a little bit of pause. Jewish oral history is often cited as being trustworthy because there is a practice uh, amongst um, rabbis and their students of taking some great care about certain kinds of Talmudic um, law elaborations to communicate those by word of mouth rather than written. And there's a sort of process, a procedure here whereby the rabbi will communicate this set of elaborations um, and emendations of the law to the student, and then the student then locks those into mind or into memory, and then ultimately when the student becomes a rabbi, he does the same thing for his students. And that has frequently been cited as a way of creating a reliable line of transmission from Jesus down to us, uh, information about what happened. So, on the basis of some, some variation or some body of points like this, uh, it's been argued widely that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. The best explanation we can construct is that that's got to be what happened. All right, so a little background. Um, and I'm no historian, I'm more a philosopher, uh, so the kind of stuff that I've got here that I'm using as history that's good enough for my argument is the same stuff you get out of an undergraduate uh, New Testament history class. I just went and looked at all the, looked at some of the most widely used, widely accepted um, uh, books, textbooks, or, or accounts of New Testament history that get used across the country in accredited universities. And thought to myself, well, look, if this is the consensus amongst historians about the basic facts uh, surrounding this event, that's good enough for me, and that ought to be good enough for me, Brazil, for uh, you know, that's 80% of Americans who are Christians. If it takes more than that to justify Jesus, then that means nobody's going to justify Jesus. Very few people get that All right, so what, what do we know? We think roughly, if there even was such a guy as Jesus, that is a point of contention. There are some people arguing whether or not there even was somebody with the other name. I'm not going to tackle that one. We'll just assume that there was this guy. Uh, I'm just picking on the question of uh, resurrection. But we think he's probably executed somewhere around 35 uh, in the common era. Uh, Mark, the first gospel account of the Jesus story, is written around 65, so 30 years later. Matthew, Luke, and John are written somewhere between 70 and 100, so another 5 to 35 years later. So a total of something that was 65 years later or more, John gets dated sometimes at 125, 150. So maybe a hundred years later, one of the major accounts. And so the four major accounts we've got in the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So all four of those are being written 30 to 100, 150 years later. Matthew and Luke uh, evidently are copied largely from Mark. They lift their story straight, almost verbatim in places, um, from Mark. And it's been postulated, I don't know how much widespread acceptance this has got, but maybe Matthew, the authors of Matthew and Luke um, also looked at another source that we now lost that gets, get, gets called the Q source. The authors of those four books were not eyewitnesses, uh, seems to be the consensus amongst historians. Uh, they possibly could have been, but it doesn't appear to be. And certainly 30 to 150 years later, they couldn't have been. Uh, or if they were eyewitnesses, it would have been decades later. Uh, John certainly, the author of John. 
And the authors were not the disciples, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Something uh, that, you know, Ernest little Matt McCormick in Bible school didn't know, didn't find out until he was well, a couple years ago. Uh, actually, I'll take on another big surprise. I found out when I was doing this research. But um, what happened is that these documents emerge out of the first few centuries of the development of the early Christian church, and then they get identified as the gospel according to Mark, and they get propagated as, here's the story, this is what Mark saw. And then the idea that Mark actually wrote it sort of conveniently doesn't gets uh, gets uh, propagated and it's often not corrected. The mistake is often not corrected. But in fact, we don't have any good reason to think that, that the actual disciple Mark wrote it or the same thing for the three. Okay, so uh, we don't know how many people the stories pass through from the events to their being recorded. So from the alleged resurrection in 35, to there being written in 65 or 100 or 125, we don't know how many people talked. We don't know how many people intervened between the alleged eyewitnesses, the repeaters who have called in the book, um, up to the authors. There may have been a thousand repeaters, there may have been three repeaters, any, any consistent open question. The ending of Mark, and this was the most shocking thing for me, the ending of Mark, and I think this starts around chapter 16, verse 8 or so, that tells the story about Jesus coming back from the dead and visiting the disciples. And the story about doubting Thomas. Thomas is all like, wait a minute, are you sure that's Jesus? <laughs> and, and everybody jumps on his case and Jesus chews him out for being doubting Thomas. All of that is, is added to Mark 125 to 150 years later. And when I found that out, I was just stunned. And I ran, went downstairs to one of the historians on the floor below me. And, I, and I'm like, Brad, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Do you, you guys all knew this? And he's like, yeah, everybody knows that. Well, I didn't know that. Really? Are you serious? Are you completely serious that the major source of information we've got about the resurrection actually got tacked on, added by yet another author, we don't know who that author is, 125 to 150 years later. So now we're talking about 35, Mark gets written 65, 30 years, and then possibly, so possibly 180 years later, we get the story about the resurrection. And, and Brad Nystrom's like, yeah, what's, what's the deal? It's a problem. He teaches New Testament history, so this is normal. Well, I'm like, well, that just sort of, raises an obvious fucking question, doesn't it? <laughs> right? About the reliability of it. 180 years. I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. <laughs> so I was mad. I was upset. It was entertaining. Um, okay, so I'll calm down and I'll make a real argument. So just yell. Yeah, okay, so we don't have any of the original Gospels, only copies of copies from 100 to 200 years later. So I got to wondering about this, and actually it was, turned out to be kind of a hard question to answer. I got to wondering, do we actually have the, the document, the first gospel according to Mark? No, we don't have that. The, the writing technology, the papyrus, and the, the parchments and the papers they used them were not of the sort that could survive until 2012. Those are all long gone, long rotted away and decayed to nothing, they fall apart. But what happened was those were written, and then people copied those, and people copied those until some era, perhaps the earliest extant copies of some of these Gospels we have date in the 200s. So there's a fragment of John that's in a Vatican vault somewhere that you can't look at uh, that's dated roughly around 250. So that's not the original uh, document written by the author of John. That's a copy of a copy of a copy that, trans that, that went on for 150 years until we got to that copy. And that thing is one. So if you were going to, if we asked this question, I got to wondering, what can I go look at that would close the gap and connect me closest to Jesus? What can now, in 2012, what can I go look at that would close the gap? Because I, I don't trust preachers, and I don't trust even some historians, I don't trust lots of people, this thing is so controversial, and there's so much, like, sort of political scrambling, and so much, and the, even the, the 
the, the discipline of the history of New Testament studies is balkanized into Jewish scholars, Christian scholars, and sort of uh, and agnostic scholars, and everyone's sort of making their cases and highly motivated reasoning. So I thought, okay, what can I look at? Well, what I can look at is some, it's a fragment um, from around 250. Now, the stuff we have would be just some little ashy fragments that would fit in the shoebox. That's what we actually got. Uh, many people are under the impression that we've got thousands and thousands of documents from this early era. Turns out what we've got are thousands and thousands of copies of stuff from 100 or so years later, uh, but there's a very, very small bottleneck through which the Jesus story traverses. So there is, sort of put it this way, so we've got this alleged event, right? Uh, you know, resurrection? We don't know, 35. Uh, Mark gets written in 65. The others, Matthew, uh, Luke, and John, get written in the decades that follow. And then there's copies and copies and copies and copies until we get to 250. And now we've got extant fragments. And during all of this era, during this period, not only were these getting copied over and over, but there was a proliferation of other documents, all sorts of other documents, other gospels, other letters, other things being written, and there's thousands and thousands of these documents out there. I've actually run out there. And what happened about 250-275 is canonization. Uh, the early Christian church got to be big enough and enough people were sort of influential enough that they sat down and said, look, we've got all of these different accounts of what Jesus was. We've got all these different documents circulating around. Many of them tell very different stories about, about Jesus. Some of them say he wasn't resurrected. Some of them say he was just a man. We need to get our story straight. So they all sit down. Um, and this, this history gets very tedious and, and, uh, and, and far more detailed than we want to go into. It. But they sit down and they distill out or they pluck out the handful of documents that you now know as the new, roughly, the New Testament Bible. And they say, this is our Bible. All of that other stuff is either heresy, it's heretical, we need to destroy it, or that's not official, that's not... It's like, um, it's like Star Wars. There's the Star Wars movies, and then there's the extended universe, the, the books, and then there's fan fiction. And fan fiction doesn't get like the Lucas approval. Extended universe kind of gets Lucas approval, but then the canon is the movies. That's where you go with the source of information. Okay, so there's a few Star Wars fans in the room besides me. But if somebody starts telling me about stuff that happened in the extended universe, I'm like, ah, oh, no, 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 no. The only stuff that really happened in the movies. But add yeah. even a little worse than that, because in the case of canonization, it's not like they had one particular set of things in the movies that was clearly the originals and everything else was based yeah. derivative. Yeah, they point. had a whole slew of stuff that they had no yeah. particular reason to think one was better yeah, than another. Yeah, that, that's actually a bad metaphor for that reason. Well, I mean, it's a good metaphor, but you can show how much worse it is. For They've them. got this proliferation of all these documents. They pluck out the handful of ones that become New Testament, and that gets sanctioned, and then that thing makes it to you here today. And that thing tells a particular story to the exclusion of all the others. We'll talk about this in a minute. This is, a, this is not dead on the topic that I want to talk about today. The canonization thing is fascinating um, because there's, there's a lot of weird things going on here. One of them that I've called the Jesus sharpshooter fallacy because you'll have modern Christians who will point to the Bible and say, look at how remarkably cohesive and organized and consistent the Bible is. It's not real, but they'll say that. And then they'll point to the cohesion or the consistency of the New Testament and the New Testament portrayal of Jesus as evidence that it's reliable. But of course, the reason it has that coherence is because those people went and deliberately picked out that set of stories and excluded all the others. So the, the Texas sharpshooter fallacy is the guy who takes a gun and shoots it at the box on the side of the barn, blam, puts a hole in the barn, and goes and draws the target around his bullet his hole. <laughs> and then he announces, I'm a perfect marksman. <laughs> Right, so the claims about the New Testament coherence and consistency is getting the order backwards. It's there because it was put there. It was created to have that. But again, the society issue. Let me get on to the uh, to the real problem. Okay, so uh, this phrase from Latin from philosophy, ceteris paribus, 
okay, if it works, uh, maybe the translation's uh, good for the goose, good for the gander. Let's look at some other historical cases. Uh, I like the Salem witch trials. What if we apply the same standard uh, that's been used in the Jesus case to other historical cases? How about the Salem witch trials? Between 1692 and 1693, dozens of people were accused, arrested, stood trial, and were tortured and hanged for sundry acts of witchcraft, possession by death of devils, and other supernatural deeds. Strange behavior in some little girls fed suspicions. Uh, and this is where the Sydenham Korea comes in. Uh, there's been some speculation that those girls were um, suffering from some side effects of not forgot. Rheumatic fever. Uh, rheumatic fever uh, produces a, anyway, the little girls were, were, were behaving oddly. They were jerking and, and sounds like sort of bad German dancing, but they were, they were jerking, <laughs> their strange movements of their arms and feet and their legs um, and their heads, and it got people alarmed, and the whole thing expanded. They got, ultimately, there's 150 people are accused of witchcraft or something like it. The governor of Massachusetts gets, gets involved. Uh, thorough investigations are conducted. Witnesses were carefully cross-examined. Evidence was gathered. Many people confessed, swore that in fact they were witches. The entire proceedings were carefully documented with thousands of sworn affidavits, court documents, interviews, and related papers. In the end, 19 people, including Sarah Good and Rebecca Nurse, have been sentenced and executed for witchcraft. All right, so I got to wondering, well, Perhaps, if we're willing to say that the evidence about Jesus shows that he was resurrected, perhaps the evidence about Salem shows that there was real magic in Salem. Actual, authentic, black magic, summoning the, some kind of supernatural force from the other side. Suppose we approach the Salem witch trials the way the resurrection has been treated. Suppose the accused at Salem were really witches. Uh, in fact, the case is even better, a fortiori, the case for real witchcraft, real magic at Salem, is better than the case for magic at Jerusalem. In fact, the comparable case for magic at Salem is better than the case for resurrection in Jerusalem. Let me show you. Uh, in Jerusalem, what do we have? No investigations that we know of. In Salem, thorough and careful investigations. In Jerusalem, no eyewitness examinations. Salem, careful examinations of the alleged witnesses. Jerusalem, hearsay accounts written 20 to 150 years after the alleged events, unknown authors, unknown other sources, unknown steps to the alleged witnesses. Salem, thousands of primary documents, we still have the actual documents, sworn affidavits, court documents, interviews, and so on, from the actual court case. In Salem, we have a court case with an active, deliberate attempt to investigate and get to the bottom of the matter and find the truth. Four to six sources of information in Jerusalem, direct confessions, hundreds of people and sources of information in Salem. Jesus' followers are alleged by others 30 years later to be dedicated to convinced. Witnesses testified with utter conviction that the accused were witches in Jerusalem. Or, sorry, in Salem. Fear of persecution and death would have discouraged lying, trickery, and falsification in Jerusalem. Certainly there were disincentives to lie in Salem. Men would lose their wives, children would lose their mothers, community members would lose their friends. Historical corroborations of many other New Testament events, okay, the trials and executions have been thoroughly corroborated with historical accounts. They could not have made up a story about something as fantastic as a resurrection. So many people could not have made up or hallucinated a story as fantastic as the witch stories, right? <laughs> Of course, you don't believe in that. Resurrections are difficult to mistake or fake. Witchcraft would have been difficult to mistake or fake. Right? You're all convinced. You're all convinced. I just convinced you, right, that there was real magic in Okay, so therefore, if the historical evidence that supports the conclusion that Jesus was resurrected, then there is an even better argument that there were real witches in Salem. Problem. There was no magic at Salem, right? We all know better. So there's something deeply wrong with this approach for Jesus' case, right? No magic in Salem implies no magic in Jerusalem. 
At least I'm going to assume that you all don't really think that they were with real witches or real magic in Salem. Maybe you do. I've had some, I've had some strange responses, I've got to say. When, I first, when this first sort of occurred to me and I started running to buy people, I was a bit shocked to sort of when I present people these options, I was a bit shocked to find out that, that for lots of people, they think magic is ubiquitous, they think it's all over the place, and some people are ready to go, yep, real magic in Salem. And I was just stunned the first time I didn't know what to say because I didn't, didn't think anyone would go that route, but lots of people did. So anyway, by any measure of quantity and quality, the evidence we have for real witches in Salem is vastly better than the evidence for the resurrection, but there were no real witches in Salem. Everyone knows that. Salem shows that an even heavier burden of proof can be met, and it remains unreasonable to believe that anything magical happened. The result, then, is that no clear-headed, consistent, and reasonable person should accept the resurrection on the historical evidence. I'm preaching the converted here, but we've got 210, 220 million people in the country who haven't gotten the memo. And I, I mean, all rhetorical flourish aside, partly what, it, what I'm doing here is, it seems to me, it's, a, it's urgent, it's important that we talk about this, it's, it's urgent that we sort of discuss the question with people. And I found myself trying to find some sort of argument that would, could possibly appeal to the believer so that they could see how from the inside, from the inside of their own story, it doesn't make any sense. I wanted to be able to appeal to the believer, but look, you don't believe in magic in all these other cases. So how could you possibly believe in magic here by your own account? Not just because I'm a doubter, I'm a skeptic, they all disqualify me because you're a baby murdering atheist, you've got your morals, <laughs> and you're already suspicious. But I wanted them to see, look at the inter there's an internal problem with the story you're telling, and it ought to be troubling to you. That, you're, that you've got one standard for Jesus, and you've got this other standard of evidence for all these other cases. All right, so more on that. Most likely, if you're a Christian, you already accepted this normal argument just like what I've made for what really happened for the origins of Islam, Hinduism, Mormonism, Sikhism, Baha'i, Buddhism, and all the other non-Christian religions. Most likely, were we to make a historical argument for the origins of Islam, the Christian would say, oh, well, that doesn't mean there's real magic at the beginning of Islam. That just means probably something natural happened. Muhammad is alleged to have uh, gone into a cave on several occasions, and then he had these profound visions where he spoke at great lengths to the archangel Gabriel. And Gabriel communicates the command of the Quran to him. And then he leaves the cave and retells these, what, what Gabriel told him to scribes and then write down the Quran. Very, very, very obviously lends itself to a similar kind of natural explanation. Which now you may be probably thinking about what are the other natural explanations for Salem. Uh, I'll more on that in a minute. So I think there's three responses that people can make to this argument. Uh, there's the right one, there's my answer. I think you've got to conclude there's magic in neither. This is why atheists get the well-earned reputation for being arrogant assholes. <laughs> Saying stuff like that. Like I just did. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm entirely prepared, actually, to change my mind on this. Uh, well, I don't know about this. But I am prepared to listen to reasons and evidence and to, to consider the alternatives and, and reflect, I'm ready to change my mind. It just seems to me that the historical evidence, the historical argument is so patently bad that it's just a non-starter. You can't even get off the ground with this thing. And we've got millions and millions of people who just take it as common sense that the Jesus resurrection story is a historical fact. You've got Christian apologists who are claiming about historians, about the mainstream of of uh, the historical establishment, you know, you go to the history department of Davis or Sac State or wherever, you've got Christian apologists claiming about historians, they say, oh well, all of the reputable historians in academia are with us on this, they agree that it's a historical, the resurrection is a historical fact. To which I got giggles and snickers when I asked the his history professors in the department across campus on my campus. They said, I didn't hear about that. No, I didn't hear any of that stuff. Okay, so we can consistently apply the standards of evidence you already accept and you've got to conclude that there's nothing supernatural happening in Salem or in Jerusalem. 
you might argue that there's magic in both cases. You might lower your standards. Supernatural events happen in both Jerusalem and Salem. 